Good afternoon. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chuck Dorn, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor of Education here at Bowdoin. And I would like to welcome you to today's Common Hour, which is this semester's Karofsky Faculty Encore Lecture. The Karofsky Family Fund was established by Paul I. Karofsky, class of 66, his brother Peter Karofsky, class of 62, and Paul's son, David M. Karofsky, class of 93, in memory of their father and David's grandfather, Sidney B. Karofsky. The fund, which has underwritten the Sidney B. Karofsky Prize for junior faculty, added the Common Hour Karofsky Lectures in the spring of 2000. The Karofsky Faculty Encore Lectures features a Bowdoin faculty member chosen by members of the student body and honors that faculty member as a teacher and as a role model. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor, Professor Judith Castleberry, Associate Professor of Africana Studies, who was selected to deliver the Karofsky Faculty Encore Lecture for this, our spring 2017 term. Professor Castleberry teaches courses on African American women's religious lives, music and spirituality in popular culture, music and social movements, and issues in black intellectual thought. Her interest in African American religious and cultural studies, with particular attention to gender, guides her research and her teaching. Her current ethnography, The Labor of Faith, Gender and Power in Black Apostolic Pentecostalism, employs feminist labor theories to examine the spiritual, material, and social and organizational work of women in a New York-based Pentecostal denomination. She is co-editor with Professor Elizabeth Pritchard of Spirit Goes Where It Listeth, Black Women and Pentecostalism in Diaspora. This collection of essays by leading scholars examines black women's engagement with Pentecostalism in Mozambique, Ghana, Nigeria, Brazil, Haiti, Grenada, and the United States. And the work is forthcoming in the Religious Cultures of African and African Diaspora People series with Duke University Press. In addition to research and publishing on organized Pentecostalism, Professor Castleberry is working on a project examining the transnational Pentecostal roots of international music icon Grace Jones and their imprint on her performance aesthetics and identity. We're going to hear a bit about that today. It is really my great honor uh, to introduce Judith. Her talk is entitled Solving the Mystery of Grace Jones, It's the Holy Ghost. Please join me in welcoming Professor Judith Castleberry. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming out this afternoon. And um, I truly am honored to have been nominated to give the Karofsky Faculty Encore Lecture. And I believe that my students know that I hold them in high regard. So I'm especially humbled by this opportunity. Thank you. My talk today is based on new research, which will culminate in a biography of Grace Jones. So a few years ago in New York, while I was conducting research on Pentecostalism, I stopped by the apartment of one of the church sisters. She let me in and went back to the kitchen where she had been. And she always had the word channel on the Christian broadcasting network playing on TV. So I sat down and began to focus on the fiery preacher. He looks like he could be related to Grace Jones, I called out to her. It's her brother, Bishop Noel Jones, she called back. Yes, the top of my head blew off. <laughs> I had been a fan of Grace Jones for years, but in that moment, uh, because I was immersed in this world of Pentecostalism, the mystery of Grace Jones made sense to me in a very particular way. Grace Jones, a PK, or preacher's kid, comes from a deeply religious inter intergenerational Jamaican Pentecostal family. And Throughout her career, Jones has confounded fans, critics, intellectuals, and scholars. Descriptions have included masculine feminine skyscraper, a question mark followed by an exclamation point, a self-made art object, and sci-fi sci fantasy. 
Much has been made of Jones's work with white male collaborators, Andy Warhol, Keith Haring, and most famously, Jean-Paul Goud, as one way of understanding her persona and performance strategies. Since the early 1990s, scholars have tapped into her work to expand analysis of gender, race, performance, minimalism, primitivism, modernism, postmodernism, postcolonialism, and transnationalism, while religion has been ignored. Jones's career in public persona would seem to attest to her rejection of religious constraints. I, however, would like to consider deeply embedded Pentecostal aesthetics and epistemology as performance strategies within her work, as well as the significance of continued artistic and personal engagement with her religious family. Rereading Jones through the lens of Pentecostalism, I argue she instigates what Dick Hebditch has called a dialogue through aesthetics, where she operates as a trickster figure. On the one hand, she infuses particular Holy Ghost modes of expression into performance, controlled drama, sermonic force, and the flash of anointed eyes. On the other hand, she uses these performance modes in a deliberately profane manner, at once reinforcing a sanctified aesthetic and turning it against itself. Inserting, <clears throat> excuse me, inserting previously unexplored Pentecostal aesthetics and critiques of Pentecostalism in Jones's work expands our understanding of her contribution to cultural production, performance art, and intellectual discourse. This work pushes against conventional notions. This work also pushes against conventional notions of how the black church sounds and appears in popular culture. That critics and scholars have ignored the influence of Pentecostalism in her work is not surprising. Mainstream churches and secular society have historically stigmatized Pentecostals as unexplainable. The misreadings of Grace Jones by journalists and scholars points to the ways in which dominant voices can render the doubly and triply marginalized invisible, or in Jones's case, illegible and mysterious. 
Jones, now in the fourth decade of her professional career, has enjoyed success as a high fashion model, actress, and recording artist. Yet none of these categories hold a composite performance art that is Grace Jones. It's her musical career, however, that provides a treasure trove of material about the push-pull of religion, family, love, desire, and sexuality. Jones's first release, Portfolio, in 1977, introduced her to disco audiences with two hits, I Need a Man and La Vie en Rose. She went on to release an album in each of the next five years. In the early 1980s, she made a transition away from disco to, an, in, to a new direction, mixing rock, R&B, and reggae. Along with recording and touring during the 80s and into the 90s, Jones appeared in films, Conan the Destroyer, A View to a Kill, Vamp, and Boomerang. In 2008, Jones's 10th studio release, Hurricane, directly explored the ongoing engagement with her religious family. With Jones's pre-release promotion, journalists and music critics began to ad address, somewhat problematically, her Pentecostal upbringing. This, however, is not a new revelation. Throughout her musical career in song lyrics and interviews, Jones has talked about her religious upbringing and its impact on her life and work. In addition to tracing some of these moments, I'm also considering the particular imprint and maybe even inspiration of Holy Ghost experience and transnational Pentecostal culture that has been in plain sight and sound and body in Jones's work. So Grace Jones comes from a family of preachers, two brothers, her father and uncle, grandfather and great uncle. Her parents, Robert and Marjorie, met and married in Spanish town, Jamaica. Her mother was 17 and her father was 22. Soon after marriage, <clears throat> her parents migrated with a new infant son, Christopher, to the United States to plant churches for their organization, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. Following a brief period in the New York metropolitan area, they landed in Waterbury, Connecticut, where their second son, Noel, and first daughter, Beverly Grace, were born. Over the next six years or so, the family moved around the New York State Rust Belt region, starting churches for the organization in Rochester, Utica, Ithaca, before settling in Syracuse in 1954. In addition to church planning, they were also growing their family. So they arrived in Syracuse with six children and the seventh and last child came soon after. The neighborhood they settled in, according to Mother Marjorie Jones, wasn't the best and neither were the schools. So a decision was made after a visit from Mother Jones's parents that the children would move to Jamaica while Robert and Marjorie worked to buy a house in a better area. Grace and five siblings relocated to Spanish Town, Jamaica to live with her grandparents. She stayed about seven years or so until she was 15. In a fascinating interview on The Tonight Show, guest hosted by Joan Rivers, Grace Jones talked about her childhood. So she glides out elegantly dressed in all black. She has on a long sleeve, hip length black leather wrap jacket, a black hooded blouse, a pencil skirt below her knees, and three inch pump heels and large sunglasses. So following some initial pleasantries, Rivers asked her what she was like as a child. She explained, I wasn't allowed to do very much. I grew up with a very religious background. I had to wear dresses that came up to my neck, sleeves down to here, indicating her wrist, and dresses below my knees, like I'm dressed right now, actually. <laughs> Jones describes the conservative style of 1950s and 1960s Jamaican apostolic Pentecostals. Throughout its history and to the present, Pentecostal doctrine is codified most rigorously on women's bodies. As an ideal, Pentecostal adherents embrace bodily aesthetics that both conceal and reveal concealing with conservative comportment and dress and revealing in worship practices that center the body. Joan still centers her body, yet she inverts what is concealed and what is revealed. She reveals her body adorned extravagantly and sometimes scantily and always sensuously. Without inversion, however, she ad adopted and spectacularly adapted the tradition of church women's hats. Did you the find him? That. I came, came to London. Now you can and, and, tell uh, the rest. I've been in Paris, and when I came back, uh, 
the girl who looked after the shop, she said, oh, Grace Jones came in yesterday. I said, OK. And, and she said, and she took all the hats. And I was like, what? <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Every single one of them. Grace, there's a, there's a lovely story yeah. about you wearing one of Philip's hats. Because I know you've worn lots of his hats over the years. This is obviously one of Philip's today. Yes. A beautiful crystal hat that was very heavy that you could hardly see through. And you had to be carried to the stage at the Royal Albert Hall. Was that, that was right? the Albert Hall. Do you remember Fashion Rocks? Oh, that, um, yes, of course. Of course. The one that looks... The one that... Well, it looks, it's aerodynamic yeah, in exactly. its, uh, its uh, art form. It, it's really a sculpture. It, it, it's a piece of sculpture. What, I don't even what consider is it? it a hat. What is it about wearing a really good hat that makes you feel very confident? Because obviously you're known not for singing, I... acting, your, your fashion, everything. Well, you know, my mum will tell you, we come from a church, you know, and, and everyone dresses up in hats. We weren't even allowed to go into church without a hat. It was absolutely mandatory that you wear a hat to go to church. So we just feel totally naked without a hat. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. It's lovely to have yeah. you here at Royal Ascot Thank today. You. And, and Philip, you as well, obviously. Thank you very much. Um, we, we it's absolutely fun to be an Ascot with a hat icon of isn't the world. It, just, isn't it must be like just. an AGM for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit like that, but it's for Marjorie as well. So when we got her, I said, Marjorie, you and I in hat heaven. Marjorie from the church oh, and me yes. from sort of Ascot. So. It's her first time, and, and I know she's just going to be... Because my mom is a professional seamstress as oh, well. Wow. We yes. all grew up sewing and making, creating... This, and this is where, where obviously where it comes from, Marjorie. Then you must be very proud of Grace. Yes, I am. I am I'm very. Yes. Very beautiful daughter you've got there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Till three in the morning. We can see where it comes from, can't we? All the late nights. Cheers. So what did you the find him? <laughs> I can't go into all that. <laughs> I can't. But oh my lord. Okay. So um, <laughs> in performance, Jones inverts the anointed performing body by exhibiting tight control. Her controlled stage persona has been a hallmark of her performance style from the physical requirements of runway model to disco dominatrix. Control is at the heart of Pentecostalism. When the Holy Ghost takes control for the first time, the sinner loses control to spirit infilling, evidenced by speaking in tongues. Thereafter, a relationship exists whereby the saint, as, as converts refer to themselves, and the spirit negotiate control of unholy impulses. A saint must maintain control of her body as a condition of self-actualization and full community inclusion. Saints explain transformations as both within and outside of their control, instantaneous and progressive. The initial infilling of the Holy Ghost begins the lifelong day in and day out process of constructing and maintaining a holy identity. I'd now like to play a sermon excerpt from Grace's brother, Bishop Noel Jones, and in it he pleads with the Holy Ghost to restrain his potentially sinful behavior, repeating, sit on me. And I note that his increasing vocal and physical intensity or lack of restraint is appreciated and understood as Holy Ghost inspired or an anointed word. Until you work it out, because the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, it sat on them. I feel like preaching in here. Give somebody a high five and say, when I need to do the right thing, I need the Holy Ghost sit on me. When my flesh is at the other level, sit on me. When that woman looks too good and I can't get around it sit on me I need you to sit on me till I learn how to control myself sit on me don't let me up Lord don't let me move I'm vulnerable right now I'm real susceptible right now I'll do the wrong thing right now sit on me hold me down
The next, clip, the next clip I'd like to play is an excerpt from French television's Le Grand Journal, where Grace Jones performs William's Blood from the 2008 Hurricane CD. This song charts the push-pull of the religious blood from her father's side, the Joneses, and the entertainer's blood from her mother's side, the Williamses, as it courses through her veins. In fact, much of the Hurricane CD can be understood in light of the tensions expressed in William's blood. The song tells the story of Mother Marjorie marrying Reverend Robert and following him all around and having little babies. Jones sings, she's so happy keeping up with the Joneses. Her mother's revelation that Grandpa Dan lived a fast life as a touring musician with Nat King Cole, womanizing and boozing up around town, leads Jones to plead, just let me go. I'm born wicked. I've got the Williams blood in me running through my veins. version of William's blood opens up other areas of consideration or for consideration. In the song's opening, Jones def states defiantly, you can't save me, you can't save a wretch like me. While it closes poignantly with Grace and her mother Marjorie slowly singing, amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
that saved a wretch like me. Grace and Marjorie have sung Amazing Grace together before, probably more times than we can know. But one instance was documented in the Syracuse Post Standard in 1993. Prior to a trip to South Africa where she would judge a Miss World pageant, Grace went home to Syracuse. Her father mentioned that he would love to meet Nelson Mandela. So the newspaper reports that a few days later, a pair of round trip tickets to Johannesburg arrived in the mail at his home. Reverend and Mrs. Jones accompanied their daughter and he was able to have a brief meeting with Nelson Mandela. The article goes on to say that Mrs. Jones didn't meet Mandela. She and daughter Grace and a small choir sang at the end of Dolly Tambo's television show as the credits rolled. They sang Amazing Grace. Williams' blood tells the story of Grace's struggle with her family and the Holy Ghost. Her opening declaration, you can't save a wretch like me, is turned on its head when Amazing Grace tells us that she's already saved. The security of salvation is reinforced by her mother's presence. In the CD booklet, Jones includes special thanks to her mom and to her brothers Chris and Bishop Noel Jones. The dedication reads, to the memory of my dad, Bishop Robert W. Jones. He had passed away a few months before the release. In a 1987 interview with Greg Gumbel, Jones describes her father as a powerful, spirit-filled man of mystery qualities she both admired and found challenging to live with. She recalled that he rose every morning at 4 a.m. and she would listen to him pray in tongues. Jones herself was speaking in tongues at the age of seven, seven, evidence of spirit baptism. The theology of tongues comes from the interpretation of the second book of Acts, which tells of the initial descent of the Holy Ghost 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus. It reads, quote, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So for the faithful, speaking in tongues is at once a reward for and a promise of transcendence. It demonstrates a worshiper's openness to receive the power of the Holy Ghost and confirms direct communication with God without an intermediary. Speaking in tongues shatters spatial and temporal boundaries as the Bible comes alive. The worshiper joins the original infilling with the apostles of the first church. In these moments, she exists in a sacred cosmos. Holy language allows her to express the previously inexpressible. It is speech that, according to Thomas Chortis, quote, does not express or represent thought. It is an act of or phonetic gesture in which one takes up an existential position in the world, calling into question conventions of truth, logic, and authority. It offers a critique of language and a positive statement about expressivity. Its critical force is enhanced by the moral force of its claim to be pure communication incapable of uttering any wrong words." End quote. So how might we incorporate the imprint of speaking in tongues on the artistic production aesthetic of Grace Jones? If speaking in tongues shatters spatial and temporal boundaries and calls into question conventions of truth, logic, and authority, how does intimate embodied engagement with the supernatural, which begins at seven years of age, alter one's identity, corporal reality, and artistic vision? Being physically overwhelmed by the spirit and speaking in tongues places the worshiper in an experiential space of immediacy. As language exists outside of time, every moment is an existential beginning. In addition to living in a world of tongue-talking believers, Jones was surrounded by evangelists and preachers. In a 1987 interview, she noted the impact it had on her work. When I watch my dad preach, she said, he gets so expressive, it's very compelling. And there's also a conviction there, and I think that's in my blood. Grace's trademark songified speech vocal style and flash of, spirit, flash of the spirit eyes come out of a preaching performance aesthetic. As well, she absorbed the intangible conviction and charisma. 
Jones's persona benefits from years of joining preachers, evangelists, and saints as they turned on holy heat instantaneously or allowed it to simmer in a slow burn. Nick Hooker, director of her recent video, Corporate Cannibal, observed, quote, Grace is hyper-charismatic. It's like a condition she has. Also, she's been famous for a very long time, so she really understands how to master her charisma. I've seen her dial it down, and she becomes practically invisible, anonymous. And then I've seen her turn it on and turn it up, and when she does that, within five minutes, people are suddenly starting to pay attention. Well, certainly years of mastery contribute to the Grace Jones we experience today, but she's been setting the, the club alight for decades. One interviewer noted, Jones excludes, exudes a charisma that's beyond logic. Pentecostal churches have provided publicly accessible sites for developing, recreating, and maintaining particular aesthetics of embodiment, vocal, vocality, and rhetoric based on interaction with the supernatural. The spirit is real because it inhabits the body. The worshiper is self-identified and recognized within the church community as a true saint because she can bring down the spirit into spaces of worship. These moments often combine spontaneity and controlled spiritual maturity. Skilled, skilled preachers, evangelists, singers, and worshipers know how to heat up and cool down a space according to the will of the spirit. Grace Jones knows the contours and mutability of Pentecostal performance, and she strives for their effects in her work. She carries the drama, control, commanding sonic register, and songified speech she absorbed from her father's preaching. No doubt, many strong churchwomen influenced Jones as well. In Jamaican and American Pentecostal churches, women significantly outnumber men. Women's majority status in often male-headed churches results in particular forms and demonstrations of power. Because spirit infilling is egalitarian, by sheer numbers, women dominate positions of spiritual authority. In conversion narratives, a majority of men identify women as the church mothers, prayer warriors, and missionaries who ushered in the spirit. In her study of Jamaican Pentecostalism, Diane Austin Bruce observes, quote, the man is there to be a male leader of women, but he will be a leader in ritual performance rather than in organization or very often in spiritual attainment." End quote. So the relationship between practices of egalitarian spirit authority and heteronormative patriarchal formal structure presents an underlying paradox within black Pentecostalism. Pentecostal gendered rhetoric, identity, and experience undergird Grace Jones's androgynous performances. Jones applied the mystery, charisma, and control that infused the Pentecostal milieu to a performance of gender, at once adopting and critiquing Pentecostal ways of knowing. Austin Bruce notes that in the Jamaican context, quote, Pentecostal Holy Ghost infilling is a process closely associated with women. Their bodies are more readily seen as vessels defiled by fornication that the Holy Ghost must cleanse, end quote. So on the one hand, women are empowered by a perceived openness and therefore proclivity to sanctification. On the other hand, personal and communal discipline weighs heavily on women's bodies and behavior, which, which circumscribes their power. Jones's critique of this particular gendering of church operations and religious bodies is what we see in Demolition Man from the 1980 classic, A One Man Show. Some scholars have read Jones's Pentecostal inspired gender boundary transgressions as, quote, a post human being or cyborg or an almost cruel inhuman robot. I would argue that they move too quickly away from the human and obscure the very real, very human sources compelling Jones's critiques. When Grace and her five siblings left Syracuse for Jamaica, they lived with their grandmother and step-grandfather, who was the bishop of the church in Jamaica. She remembers him as cruelly authoritarian. I'm so scary, she said, because I'm acting out my step-grandfather on stage, all his movements. He scared us every day. He would say, whatever bad thing you're going to do today, you will be beaten when you get home, even if you hadn't done it. So you'd be scared all day. As a bishop, 
Her step-grandfather's divine authority reinforced his parental authority in very complicated ways. So in Demolition Man, her high-heeled, Armani-clad, androgynous figure comments upon the feminine foundation of a Pentecostal world that maintains a facade of uncomplicated masculinity. Jones, always the trickster, harnesses the control of the sanctified body and allows it to materialize as the deviant, gender-ambiguous body. She becomes the demolition man because she knows him. She sings in the chorus, I'm a walking nightmare, an arsenal of doom. I kill conversation as I walk into the room. I'm a three-line whip. I'm the sort of thing they ban. I'm a walking disaster. I'm a demolition man. At times, she plays with the pronunciation and identification of Demolition Man by sounding a long E in Demolition, turning it into Demolition. scholar observes cut after cut the robot in the Armani suit appears strangely lifelike. While Francesca Royster asserts that Jones is quote arguing for black humanity and the complexity of black experience end quote. To my mind both analyses ring true. Jones portrays an abusive parental and religious authoritarian with intensity that renders him for many unreadable as human. It's an intensity born out of a young girl's terror operating in natural and supernatural realms. For Jones, critiquing male authority goes hand in hand with challenging the ways in which church women uphold heteronormative power structures. The socially risky behavior of her offstage persona exhibits a particular masculinity and anti-femininity as understood through religious renunciations of sin. Women's narratives of spiritual transformation within Jamaican Pentecostalism focus on embodiment, maintaining a purified vessel, whereas men's narratives highlight the abandonment of social habits, smoking, gambling, and womanizing. Jones's sexualized feminine and anti-feminine body and repertoire fly in the face of Pentecostal standards of female comportment. Ramon Lobato's meditation on Jones posits, quote, we are left with the impression that Jones has done it all. 
that she has experienced the highest highs and the lowest lows, that she drinks only Cristal, eats only caviar, and has not slept since 1984, end quote. So Jones's outrageous adult presence pushes against religious mores, yet, by her account, she survives life on the edge because of the power of her family's prayers. In an early 1990s interview, she reflected on living dangerously. I had pretty wild fantasies from growing up, to, up in Jamaica with nothing happening. I mean, I wasn't allowed to do anything. So when I got out and got to the States, I was like motorcycle gangs, hell's angels, I was taking all kinds of drugs, totally hallucinating, really out there. I was lucky I survived it. But I have a few guardian angels. My dad's a preacher, so he's praying for me all the time. I think that helps. My mom is praying, my uncle's a bishop, my two brothers are preachers. I think they're all praying for me so that when I do get low, they don't all run off and leave me alone. They're always there. I think that's really important. That just sort of brings you back. It just brings you back. I'd like to conclude with an audio clip from one of my visits to the Jones Family Church in Syracuse. I was there for, um, there were two days of services that were honoring um, Bishop uh, Robert Jones, who had passed a few years earlier. So on the first night of services, um, Grace was supposed to be there, but she got caught up in travel coming back from Australia. So the first night of services, the, um, as the services were progressing, Mother Marjorie Jones was making it really clear to the pastor, who was Maxwell Jones, Grace's brother, that they had to get Grace on the phone to talk to the congregation. They tried to get through, they couldn't get through. So they ended the service. The second night, service was going on, and again, Mother Marjorie Jones was saying, you know, you really have to get Grace on the phone. And it became really clear that he couldn't actually end the service until they got Grace on the phone. So they did get Grace on the phone. And this is what transpired. Go ahead. Grace? Why you ain't putting on speaker, Mom? Hello? Can you hear me? I'm on speaker. Yes. All right, go ahead. Take your text. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. Grace Jones has been telling us this transnational story of the push-pull of family, love, faith, and desire, negotiated at the intersection of religion, gender, race, and sexuality. To my mind, Grace Jones has been a mystery because critics and scholars have a limited number of registers with which to interpret black women's lives. Pentecostal aesthetics and critiques of Pentecostalism have further exacerbated her unknowability. Jones learned techniques for restraining the ecstatic in church from preachers, evangelists, church mothers, gospel singers, and spiritually mature worshipers. She carries the intensity of performative female bodies constrained by doctrine and liberated by Holy Ghost anointings. She performs and critiques the masculinities and femininities she saw replicated and ruptured in Jamaican and New York religious communities. Pentecostalism pervades her person, persona, and performance. And the Jones family has remained close throughout the years, which means Grace's direct contact with the world of Pentecostalism has never ceased. Thank you.
So we have um, a few minutes for um, questions, if you have questions or comments. And um, as I said, this is the beginning of a project, so um, I'm really interested in um, any feedback that you may have or ideas that you may have about how to approach this work. Oh, wait, uh, wait for the microphone because we need to have you on the live stream. What, what? <laughs> Andrew, great presentation. Um, I grew up Pentecostal, so this is all is ringing bells to me, bringing me back a bit. Um, but how was her relationship with her family? Like, is it, they have a good relationship? Is that was just for show for for kind of media, or how's that relationship with her family? They actually have a. They're very close. Um, she goes back and forth to Syracuse pretty often. Uh, once her father passed away, um, her mother actually goes out on the road with her. You know, kind of. As often, I think as often as, as she can, given her mother's very active in the church too. So, um, but her mother goes out with her quite a bit, and um, so yeah, they're close. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm. I see. What I understood, there's at least two sides to Pentecostalism that you presented. One. Uh, a side of discipline and control, and then another, a side of recognizing uh, sin and the susceptibility to uh, losing control of oneself. So I wanted to know, you, you, you read her performance and her art, um, the way she uh, presented her body, clothing, as the discipline side of her, and that Pente we see her Pentecostalism, we see Pentecostalism's influence on her through her tightly controlled presentation and her art. I wondered in that last clip when she was on the phone, and even maybe in the song where she evokes Amazing Grace, in her beseeching other saints, her mother, her brother, to pray for her, is, mm -hmm. is that her recognizing? Because she's not like her brother. She's not you know, preaching. She's not you know, calling upon people to recognize God in a particular way. We didn't see any of that. Right. Um, but she is um, um, beseeching saints to mm -hmm. remember her and to mm -hmm. pray for her. So I wondered, mm -hmm. we see so much of the discipline side of Pentecostalism through her mm -hmm. art. Is that, are, can you read or do you read her re re requesting prayer and, and watching over as another side of the the undisciplined side of, of the Pentecostalism? Um, I would, thank you for that question. That's a great question. Um, I wouldn't read um, her um, engagement with the, with the family and the church and the congregation to keep her in prayer as engaging with the undisciplined side necessarily. Um, I just see that as a way that she um, keeps a very real connection in kind of a straightforward way with the church and with the congregation. And when I was, when I was there too, um, the congregation loves her. I mean, they love her and, it, and it's, I mean, they know, everybody knows who she is. Everybody knows what she, who, what she does. They know her public persona. They know that, you know, in, in the eye of the public, she's very wild, she's sinful. She's a heathen. I mean, she's a heathen, right? They love her. And so it's a, it's a to me, I think it also, this, one of the things, that um, this work, uh, what I want to kind of think about in this as well, is um, to disrupt this idea that very, very religious, kind of even what some would consider fundamental, religious communities throw out their heathen children, right? It's much more complicated than that. It's very complex. So, uh, you know, I said that one of the things about this project is that to me it shows that, that we have a limited number of ways in which to uh, in, in which to understand black women's lives. I think the other thing that this project is really, is really showing me is that we really uh, have, don't have a really good understanding of, of how deep love is. Like fundamentally to me, this is a love story. And so, so the way that, and this is kind of going beyond your question, but the way that she engages that community and that it's reciprocal and has been reciprocal all along is really kind of a very direct connection and not her pushing against it in any way. It's really just engaging it on its own terms.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my question is um, maybe if you could speak a little bit more about the concept of grace that she seems to draw upon. And then also I was interested, I think related to that, in the language around the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost um, that sits on you but also um, comes into your body. Mm -hmm. So those seem to be kind of different ways of imagining like how the Holy Ghost is related to your body. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that. Thank you. Great questions. Um, uh, I would say in terms of the uh, thinking about the concept of race and how to think about um, uh, how blackness... I think the concept of race. But uh, the concept of what? Race. Oh, grace. I'm going to put a G on that. Because <laughs> I could really go in deep on blackness, too, okay? So I'm going to put a G on that. Okay, um... Uh, the concept, well, let, me, let, me, let me go to the second one because I was all in the blackness thing already. Okay, I was already there. Okay, so let's go to the, to the language of, of sitting, uh, sitting on and coming in. That's a great question. Um, and I think that, that I would, I would um, respond to that in the fact that um, uh, once, once fully initiated into the church community, the spirit is in you, right? But the, that relationship with the spirit is this ongoing um, negotiation, right? So, so in ways, in some, in some ways, um, uh, saints will say that they are compelled to do things, and in other ways, are compelled on certain behavior. And in, in other instances, they will talk about how they actually have to um, work at living a holy life. So I would see that, that relationship between, it, like Noel, Noel Jones is saved, the spirit is inside, inside of him, but he's also performing this, um, he's performing that negotiation for the congregation. He's, he's, he's probably taken a very direct scripture and he's performing this, uh, the, the, he's performing the struggle that he, that he knows that saints are dealing with all the time. So, the, so to, to narrate it as this kind of external where the saint is kind of all-encompassing, right? The Holy Ghost is inside, but the Holy Ghost is everywhere. So it's inside, it's outside, and so it, sitting on him doesn't actually, I think, negate the idea that it's also inside of him. And now, grace, what do you mean by that specifically? How are you thinking about it? Um, so I was thinking about specifically around the um, song where she says, you know, uh, you know, I can't be saved, yeah. um, and then where she sings "Amazing Grace," um, and it seems like this idea of like the possibility of being saved and the impossibility of being saved is sort of floating around a lot of what she's doing, and mm -hmm. so I don't know how Pentecostals think about the role of grace in being saved, like if, if you can be, can, you know, if you need to be punished all the time, then it makes me wonder how grace operates. Um, and so I was just wondering, like, what is their sense of how, how grace operates? Salva, it's being saved is through the grace of God, right? So, so God's grace is what allows you, uh, gra God's grace is what allows anyone to be saved, right? Um, in terms of how I think that operates in that particular text, which I think is indicative of some other um, of other attitudes about her relationship with salvation, that on one hand she's she's saying that she is a wretch and she's sinful, but and I think this I think that the fact that she will then say I'm saved. Um, to me, that echoes back to when she talks about her family and prayer. So on one hand, um, she, on one hand, I think that she um, expresses this idea of being outside of the bounds of the church and how she operates in the world and in her performances. But on the other hand, I think that she's really operating very much so understanding that she's still very much within the bounds of of salvation and grace. And so it's a very, I think it's this kind of ongoing 
kind of back and forth, as I call it, the push-pull. I think it's a real kind of constant push-pull. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, thank you. Time for one more question. One more. Going once. Yeah, oh, that was great. I just gave a presentation on saints and sinners in music, so it was very much in line with, so we have to have lunch for sure, yes, but I was curious, <laughs> with sort of with one foot in heaven, one foot in hell in a manner of speaking and the yeah. multidimensionality of her persona, uh, it sort of follows on what, what you were just talking about in terms of has she, with her background, given any uh, sort of public explanation of these contradictions in her life? Uh, or does she see them existing within her equally? You know, does she have any personal conflict about having this very, you know, kind of unique public persona and what she's doing and having a, a family background of Pentecostalism and, mm -hmm. and, and, and God and so on, morality mm -hmm. and whatnot? Yeah. Um, well, because she's always talked about Pentecostalism and because she's always talked about her family and the church and her upbringing, um, that's kind of been a, a, a given in some ways that hasn't really been addressed. But in terms of how she talks about um, her relationship with God, she says that she has her own relationship with God. So she doesn't, she doesn't, she certainly doesn't see herself as Pentecostal. Right, she doesn't. She wouldn't say she was Pentecostal. She she says that she has her own relationship with God. She has her own form of spirituality, and so it op, so in terms of how she self identifies, it operates in a much more expansive way than how she came up understanding the theology and doctrine of Pentecostalism. And even in some of in um, her biography that came out um, a year and a half ago. Um, in the beginning, in the introduction, she talks a lot about um, ancestors, and she has a whole opening section where she's traveling through Jamaica, and it's very kind of spiritually infused. She's talking about the environment and the sounds and the smells and kind of tying that to the earth and, and her relationship with ancestors. So she really has a very kind of broad and expansive way that she thinks about her relationship with the divine or with the spiritual world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.